Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Future of Infrastructure, the second of IEDC's five-part webinar series, Future Ready Economic Development Organizations. I am Julie Engel, President and CEO of the Greater Yuma Economic Development Corporation and Chair of the Task Force that guided the research paper, Future Ready, Preparing for Tomorrow's Economy, developed by the Economic Development Research Partners Program. I will be your moderator today. Last week's webinar talked about visioning and the importance of long-range thinking and planning. Today, we will explore the topic of infrastructure development oriented towards the future and the role of economic development professionals in that space. Joining us are two experts who have worked extensively on helping communities be better prepared for the future by focusing on their infrastructure. But before we begin, I would like to share a few housekeeping notes from IEDC. Please note that all attendees will be muted during the webinar. To ask a question of the speakers, please type your questions into the question box during the QA period at the end of the session. I will pose your question to the panelists. If your question isn't addressed today, the panelists will respond to you directly. Within 24 hours of today's webinar, an evaluation will be emailed to you by IEDC. Please complete the evaluation as we do use this feedback to improve our web seminars. At the end of this evaluation, you'll receive a link to download today's presentations, and you'll also receive a link to download your free copy of the EDRP report at the end of this survey. So I'm going to kick off today's presentation with a brief overview of the future of infrastructure in the EDRP paper that this series is based upon, Future Ready, Preparing for Tomorrow's Economy. So moving on, excuse me, my, here we go. Future Ready, the report looks at things that economic developers should be thinking about over the next 10 years or so and offers some practical resources about how to go about doing that. So what can economic developers do to better prepare for their organizations and communities for the future? I'm sorry, this is very sensitive. Sorry about that. Technology is advancing at an unprecedented level. Technology advancement is not only disrupting entire industries, it is changing the way we work and will impact economic development in the long term. And that change is happening faster and faster. Accelerating pace of technology advancement will impact the environment in which economic developers operate, as well as the larger global framework in which our communities exist. Economic developers need to be better prepared to guide their communities in the future where the pace of change will be much faster. So what is infrastructure? What infrastructure will sustain the digital economy? Access to quality infrastructure will govern the competitiveness of communities to attract and grow tomorrow's business. And it is not only access to high-speed fiber networks, which is, which is crucial, of course, but we need to think about transportation and the types of investments we need to make in order to be prepared for autonomous vehicles. Building designs for commercial and industrial buildings and how those need to change in order to be more flexible and accommodate more types of uses and a whole host of other types of infrastructure needs. The report examines some of these, and today we will be talking about access to high-capacity fiber networks will be essential for many types of industries in the future. Examples include companies dealing with big data, fintech, and autonomous vehicles. Cleveland has a 100-gig network, unusually large, but able to help big data companies. It is one of the examples studied in the report. Economic developers are well-served to partner with other experts, such as land use planners and transport planners to determine how high-capacity fiber networks will be laid to ensure businesses have easy access. Most businesses need much less, however, and more everyday challenges making 5G widely available. Key here is a good small cell coverage that allows for 5G signals to be extended down from the large macro cell towers to the street levels. These small cells, roughly the size of a pizza box, are set on top of an existing light pole or telephone pole in a community. So we are going to now move into our speakers, and I would like to introduce our first speaker. Beginning with Dr. Norman Jackness, Senior Fellow at the Intelligent Community Forum and faculty member at Columbia University, where he teaches in its master's degree programs, 
for Applied Analytics and Technology Management. Dr. Jackness has decades of executive and leadership experience in the public and private sectors and has successfully led organizations to adopt innovations, upgrade technologies, and embrace data-driven culture, starting with work for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He has designed various projects that blend the digital and physical to create new urban destinations and spaces. Prior to his current role, Dr. Jackness was director in Cisco's IBSG group, where he worked extensively and in-depth with governments and businesses around the world on innovative strategies. Previously, he served more than 10 years as CIO and Commissioner of Westchester County, New York government, where he was responsible for all technology, analytics, internet, and broadband activities, as well as technology-based economic development. Please help me welcome Dr. Norman Jackness. Thank you, Julie. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, hi. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, highlight, we could talk forever about this stuff, but I'm going to highlight just a couple of uh, important messages here for you today. Uh, we can carry on with other topics if you'd like during the questions. So let's see if I can get this thing moving here. Delaney, do I have control on this? There we go. All right. First, I want to give you a quite, quite a little bit of background about uh, what the Intelligent Community Forum is. Um, it, uh, you may have heard of it or maybe not. Um, it's probably best known for its annual awards ceremony, so it chooses the smart 21 communities of the year from around the world from hundreds and hundreds of applications, uh, then the top seven intelligent communities, and then finally at its annual summit, it, in, it chooses the most intelligent community of the year. Um, this annual summit is coming up in June in New York. Last year we were in London. Um, but that's really not the important part of this. This is um, a, ICF is also a think tank. It's been around for more than 15 years. Uh, it precedes all this current discussion about smart cities. Uh, but the emphasis has always been not on the low-level kind of sensors, but on a sort of high-level use of, of technology as a foundation to build economic prosperity um, and, uh, and deal with uh, social development and quality of life. Um, it is, as an organization, it's a global network of uh, cities, uh, counties, metro regions uh, from around the world, um, actually much more outside of the U.S. than inside. Um, and right now we have um, 160 cities, metros, and counties in five continents. The populations of our members uh, who are sort of part of this group uh, vary from 10,000 to 12 million, so it's quite a bit of range. Uh, we're familiar with economic development issues in major world-class, if you will, uh, metro metroplexes, but also very small towns. All right, so that's that. I just wanted to also point out that, that we take a very practical approach in, in uh, Really, our starting point is, when we do work with communities is a workshop, and, and we're trying to do three things, very simple things, providing the context and what the, why you have the need for the infrastructure, providing real examples of how you can use this, and we, we're doing this to encourage some creativity locally. It's not always a question of copying what somebody else has done, but actually thinking about what's most appropriate for your own community. And then as we leave, we ask every, every single person or organization in our workshop to find a way that their community, that their residents can get value from their investment in infrastructure, not five years from now or 10 years from now, but in the next three to six months. Um, and we sort of hold them accountable for delivering on that potential. Um, you don't need to, to have us run these workshops. Uh, you know, we're a nonprofit, so it's not, not a big deal for us, but we encourage you to take this kind of approach uh, yourself uh, as you think about uh, how to get economic value out of uh, any investment you've been making or will be making in technology infrastructure. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about why we need this uh, real quick. Um, I think first it's worth uh, uh, emphasizing to you that we are in the early stages of the Internet. Everybody thinks we're very sophisticated. Um, I actually think that uh, we're very much like 100 years ago when people still talked about horseless carriages and didn't really understand the full economic and urban implications of cars. Um, so we're doing a lot of texting now. Uh, but by 2030, we're going to have easy visual communication uh, with anybody anywhere, and this is important for the following reason. Um, we need to have communications that's visual. Uh, the research that's been done on this is pretty clear. Only 7% of the communication between human beings is actually about the text of the communications. Uh, the rest of it's about the way things are said and about facial expressions and body language. Uh, and until we really have that, uh, you know, our virtual world is a sort of easy, uh, easy way of doing things, we're not going to really see the full impact. 
Um, and, and that infrastructure, by the way, that you need for that, that's where the gig stuff comes in. That's where the higher bandwidth comes in, because you need more than just the low level of communication speeds that uh, would be okay for texting when you're talking about video. Uh, it needs at least a few megabits of uh, connection speeds uh, in order to work well. Um, we see some of this already, right? We see FaceTime, uh, we have Google Hangouts. Uh, I love the picture on the right, uh, the grandparents Skyping with the grandkids. Uh, having dinner with them via Skype. Uh, so this is happening more and more. Um, people are getting used to this. Um, and you even have people who are working. So here's uh, somebody who's a potter showing off her work to somebody who might be buying it or helping sell it. Um, even this kind of thing where you have many different participants. It's not just one-to-one. -one. Um, I actually run online classes at Columbia University in which I have 60 students who are online like this. Um, so th the capability is there today. Uh, it's a question, obviously, of how you can be creative in using it. Um, then building the infrastructure. I think it's another important point. Uh, and when I speak to economic development folks, it's that they're thinking, oh, my God, it's going to cost a lot of money and all that sort of stuff. Um, think about it this way. There isn't only one way for a person to get from point A to point B. They all have their advantages and disadvantages, depending upon the circumstances and your budget. Um, I think the same thing is true for broadband. There isn't only one way for a person to get broadband. Um, and the actual, what's called the protocol, the, the rules for communicating on the Internet, um, don't really care what your physical communications medium is. So you can even combine these things. Um, and obviously, fiber is what everybody thinks is the gold standard of this, and obviously it has a lot of capabilities. But people use satellites. They use Wi-Fi. Uh, they use fixed wireless and free space optics, which carry an enormous signal, uh, basically over laser beams. Uh, there's uh, this new development coming out of white space, and even balloons uh, in providing coverage uh, during emergencies or over sparsely uh, populated territories. Uh, basically, you can use balloons to create uh, a virtual 50-story building uh, that then has this uh, antenna on top that people can communicate uh, with uh, if they can see it. So there's a lot of different options, and I want you to remember that. It's not only, only the only option is not the one they have to use in Midtown Manhattan. Um, I think you also need to find the deployment and operations model, the business model that works. Uh, typically, people in economic development and in government think that I got to go to the major telecom or cable providers to build and operate the network. You can, uh, and if you can get them to do that, as I was able to, uh, it's great. But there are other options, um, and even some creative people. So I have a picture here of a little town in rural Mississippi, Quitman, Mississippi, which is about 2,000 people, um, and, uh, and and they entered a contest with a regional telecoms provider called Ceasefire. Uh, basically, Ceasefire, like a, a number of other local regional uh, operators, said, hey, if you can get a majority of your residents to uh, sign up for broadband, we'll install it. And so they did it, and it's $80 a month for a gigabit connection. Now, there are other packages and discounts and so forth you can add on, uh, but that's an incredibly low price. Consider how much you pay now for, I'm sure, uh, what's a lot less than a gigabit. Um, and there are even other things. So you've got, you know, you've probably all heard about Gig City, which Chattanooga, they've been enormously successful. Lafayette, Louisiana, in Cajun country, has also been successful. And partly the reason they've been successful in rolling out gigabit early is because they already ran an uh, electric utility as a municipality, and which is fairly easy for them to lay over that the communications capability as well. So that's another option. Um, and finally, if everything else fails, I'll throw this example out. This is from Northwestern England. Um, and it's the, uh, I call it B4RN, they actually call it the Barn Project. Um, it, um, it started uh, as a cooperative, and that's what it is now. I basically, they said, hey, we have equipment, we got backhoes, we're farmers, you know, we can do this. Um, and basically, um, they, uh, they laid out uh, uh, this project for themselves. And as you can see, they have enormous numbers of people now who are using uh, their service. Uh, this is an interesting point, by the way, you may not think about. We think of broadband projects as technology projects. Uh, actually, the majority of the cost is construction. It's actually, you know, laying, cutting holes in the ground or doing stuff on poles uh, that allows the uh, fiber or other capabilities to uh, go about. It's uh, not so much the technology cost itself. All right. Uh, I think the other thing I would point out is that don't just try to do these things as a single purpose project. This is a foundational capability. Um, and so, yes, you can talk about the need for high-speed communications in general, but you should be able to tie it into healthcare, education, business development, and so forth. Uh, in, in Chattanooga, they tied it into smart grid uh, for the electric power system. Um, the more sources you have, the more purposes you have, the more possible sources of funding there would be for these projects.
And of course, it gives people more reasons, gives people more reasons to use this technology foundation that you're laying out. So that's that's you know sort of the basics about sort of how to get to do this. Then let's talk about economic benefits of broadband infrastructure. Uh, you're all familiar with this, I think, uh, from the year 1900 to the year 2000. There was complete reversal of what the American labor force did. Um, in the year 1900, um, uh, well over a majority of people were producing goods and food. Uh, it switched around till the year 2000. They were producing services. Um, and a very small percentage of the population was actually in the production of goods and food. Uh, but it's not just that service economy that you're all familiar with. It's been the rise of the knowledge economy. And you can see some of this data. Uh, this, the, the, the fastest growing part of the economy has been in cognitive jobs, in knowledge jobs. And we now have over 60 million knowledge workers in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and, and this affects all kinds of areas, uh, both private sector and public sector. By the way, those of you who are interested in this, uh, I'll be making available these slides uh, to uh, to the council later on, so you can go into this in more depth and you know refer to them if you'd like to. Uh, there's also, along with this, the rise of independent workers or freelancers, um, and uh, uh, and so this is also an important factor in how people are working and how they make a living, which is something you need to understand from an economic development point of view. So where does this lead to? For me, I think these trends present a key question for economic strategy in the future decades. Think about it. When most people can work anywhere because they're working virtually, they're doing knowledge work that doesn't require them to be in a physical place. They can actually they are freelancers, many of them. Where will they choose to live and work? Um, that's an option. That, that's sort of a key question for you in terms of the viability of your local economy. Um, now, broadband has had a big economic impact. Uh, the classic study by Brookings uh, showed that for every percentage point increase in broadband penetration, employment increased by 0.2 to 0.3% per year. Um, and uh, SNG, which is a US-based consulting firm on this, uh, said that there's a more than 10-fold increase in the value of investments in broadband. Uh, in the UK, uh, they figured out it was a 20-fold increase. This is a government report. For every uh, pound that the government was investing in broadband, the economy benefited by 20 pounds. Um, and, and similarly, uh, in, in the European Union, uh, they did a study on this. And one of the things they point out is not all of this stuff is being measured. Not all of the positive impacts are being measured. Uh, there was an article about this in the New York Times uh, a few years ago uh, that, that, in general, the current economic statistics don't really measure the benefits of a lot of this technology foundation. And I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, when, so, when some of you were children, depending on how old you were, uh, there was this very influential uh, publication called Encyclopedia Britannica, and they probably had, I don't know, a couple billion dollars a year in sales, I don't remember. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, if you could afford it, you get it, uh, otherwise you had to go to the library. And uh, now we have Wikipedia, um, and a lot of people use Wikipedia. It's much um, more widely uh, dispersed, uh, much more valuable, actually, to people in general than Encyclopedia Britannica was. Yet, if you looked at it from a pure GDP point of view, uh, there's been a decrease in the GDP because instead of a couple of billion dollars or whatever the revenue was from Encyclopedia Britannica, we're down to whatever it is, a couple of million that it takes to uh, run Wikipedia. Um, so the measurement says the economy has decreased. The value to consumers has gone up. We haven't yet actually figured out how to measure a lot of this impact. You know, on the other hand, it's not at all surprising. It took us well over 100 years to figure out how to measure the industrial economy after uh, industrialization started. All right. Um, I think there are a number of things you can do from an economic development point of view. I think you need to understand that you can connect your local entrepreneurs to the global flow of capital. There are all kinds of new ways people can raise money, um, and that's important. And they can do it in a way that doesn't require them uh, to move somewhere else. It used to be that if you had a great idea, you had to move to San Francisco and New York because that's where your VCs or venture capitalists were. That's no longer true. Um, I think it's also you can connect entrepreneurs to research at great universities. I hear this a lot from mayors. Um, and from uh, economic development folks, oh, we, we wish we had a Stanford or MIT or Princeton or Harvard or whatever in, in our area, and we're doing the best to make sure our local university is like that. Well, that's great, and there's nothing wrong with investing in the local university, uh, but none of these universities, including the ones at the top, have uh, a monopoly on all knowledge. The nice thing about giving people broadband access uh, today is that they can have access to the research that's being done everywhere. And then it's just a question of helping your entrepreneurs, uh, your, your local folks, figure out uh, how to commercialize some of those new ideas. 
Um, you can even connect low-tech businesses. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, this was in Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, they did a broadband project there. They wanted to help local people get the benefit from it economically. Uh, one of the group, one of the uh, people that they worked with uh, was a woman who did baked bags, who sort of, knit, I guess, I'm not sure, did I guess, made baked bags for her husband, who was a lobsterman. Um, and she figured, okay, I'll go online. Maybe there's some lobsterman somewhere else who doesn't have a wife who knows how to do this, and I'll sell it there. Because she was on the internet, she had the opportunity to then have other customers, and it turned out she ended up selling a few hundred of these a year as night bags for a woman who owned a store on Madison Avenue in New York. So this is not just a question about using broadband because you get a bunch of techies doing stuff. This is helping people who already have businesses and skills reach out to the global economy. Uh, we're so convinced of this. Uh, that uh, one of the things we've been working on is this idea of a virtual metropolis. So one of the problems, if you're not in one of the major metroplexes like New York or London, uh, is that it may be hard to find all the skills you need. You may not be able to find somebody locally who has the marketing skills you need for a product you've come up with. Um, so what we want to do is create the virtual equivalent of those without you having to move. Um, as we say in our logo, helping you make a living where you want to make a life. Um, and um, and you can see our sort of little logo in the upper right. It's all the little fish gathered together. They can virtually com uh, compete with the large metroplexes. This is something that's in development now. If anybody's interested, please feel free to contact me. So that's on the economic side. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, create uh, delightful urban experiences. This is part of, of economic development as well. Uh, and uh, you don't necessarily think about it, but this is a part where you, you work with the urban planners and the mayor's office and the governor's offices and so forth. Um, I think there are a variety of reasons why you can blend the digital and the physical. Um, one is just to create new destinations. Uh, and the other is just to surprise people. And, and you know, the way we put it is you can entertain, you can engage, and you can educate both residents and visitors. And I'll give you some examples. One, one is pretty obvious. You've probably seen this. I'm not sure how many people actually have used it, but you can actually use your phones now, hold it up, the phone knows where you are geographically, can analyze the images, and what you can then do is tell them about local things that are important to, that they may not know about when they come visiting, or even if they're local folks and they, they are not used to that part of town. Um, you can do this thing. This is a project that I was involved with. This is actually the, uh, a public library with a fairly ugly concrete wall, um, and it's actually near, right across the street from a train station and a park. Um, and we talked to the mayor and said, hey, let's do something with this. And so across the street from that wall, we put this projector. Um, and you can see on the side of the, the, the pole there are two speakers. So they had sound and video. Um, and you can do all kinds of fun stuff. So we projected against the wall. That's me with the mayor. Um, and uh, you can do all kinds of things when you have this capability. Um, you can take an old building. And uh, let's see if this works. I'll show you a little bit of it. Um, I guess not. All right. Uh, we'll have to skip that. Uh, but you can project anything against a building. Um, you can uh, even um, project on the ground and, and, and people interact with it. Um, you can uh, hello. Um, you can show another location in town that people may not be aware of. Um, you can show another time. So on the right is a picture of what that looks like. The li library is off to the right. This was uh, the, the Selma River going out to the Hudson River in New York. Uh, it was it was for decades covered over by a parking lot, um, and it now became a park. Uh, but they also wanted to remind people of what it was like before. So the picture on the left is what it looked like underneath in the old days. So you can mix time. You can make it summer when it's winter and vice versa. Um, you can show the history. Uh, one of the things we did was every single day, uh, we would project the, the news of 100 years ago as if it were today's news, and we'd also actually have like a, a radio broadcast. Um, and uh, this gave people a sense of the place they lived in and its history of creativity. Um, you can remind people of the talented and creative residents who've lived there and still live there. This is an example of Ella Fitzgerald. Um, this would actually include sound as well as the video that was the people would hear and see. And I'm trying to get this to move. Hello. Are we stuck? Uh, there we go. Uh, you can also enable people to interact in various ways. Uh, the picture on the left is actually from Melbourne, Australia, where they basically did this kind of blending uh, to create uh, piano steps. And as people walked up there, uh, they would uh, uh, they'd play music. And this actually encouraged people not to take the escalator, but do the healthy thing of walking the stairs. On the right is something where you could use either your phone or actually your hand uh, to create animations on the wall and have some fun with people. 
Um, and you can even do this kind of thing. So this is actually the Hudson River waterfront. Uh, this is something, if nobody's using it, we'll see through the, uh, the buildings there to the waterfront, to the other side. But you can go up to it and actually talk to somebody who's in another city and have a casual conversation with them and show them what your city is like. All these things add to the sense of I live in a cool place and I'm getting, getting the word out about what this cool place is. Finally, I talk about Main Street, and I think it's important. Um, um, you know, Main Streets have had a problem um, and competing against Amazon and all that, but now with these technologies, you can actually enhance the capability of Main Street. Here's a good example where you can have a local clothing store use this virtual mirror, and they basically can help show people what it would be like to try something on without it actually being there, and then they can get it in without having to drive inventory courses. This is a, a cost, rather. This is a way of really helping to revitalize the main streets that have really suffered over the last couple of decades. All right, key takeaways. I'll wrap this up. There isn't only one way to deploy broadband or operate it. I want you to remember that. Be creative about it. Uh, broadband infrastructure is necessary for residents to achieve their connection to the potential of this global economy that we're in. Um, and you can blend the physical aspects of a city uh, with the digital infrastructure to create new and delightful uh, uh, destinations that residents will appreciate, will keep them there. Remember, they can move to a lot of places and will attract visitors. Um, final thought, uh, while I think about the future today, um, I, love, um, I, I love this quote from Wayne Gretzky, a good hockey player just plays where the puck is, a great player plays where the puck will be. Uh, the more dark side of this was from Jack Welch, the former CEO of General Electric. If the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. Um, I would point out that uh, in the report that Julie referred to, uh, there was a, a talk about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. I actually teach that at Columbia University. Uh, the kind of stuff I'm talking about today is actually the near future. You may think of it as somewhere distant. It is not. That machine learning and artificial intelligence is setting up yet another wave the wave after the current one from internet connectivity that you'll have to think about as well. In any event, laying a foundation for a flourishing future takes time, so start doing things today. I think people need a sense of urgency. It's not going to happen overnight, and you want to make sure you're doing the right stuff today. With that, I thank you very much. I think I'll turn it back to Julie. All right. Well, thank you very much, Norm. And if, just a reminder, if you have questions for Norm, please type those in, and we'll get to it during the Q&A. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, who is David Sandel, co-founder of iNeighborhoods. David is an accomplished smart city urban planner. Recently, he was recognized as the lead author for the St. Louis chapter of the book, Smart Economy and Smart Cities, a collaborative effort between 10 cities and 13 countries. David also served as an advisor to the Kansas City Google Fiber Mayor's by state Innovation Team, MBIT, the Mid-America Regional Council of Kansas City and was the co-author of Playing to Win, the Kansas City Google Fiber Playbook. This playbook outlined the civic infrastructure necessary to make a successful gigabyte city and has since become an industry standard for mapping the development of fiber internet communities, smart and gigabit cities. David is also the co-founder of the Gigabit City Summit, which is a telepresence-based global roundtable, which explores the issues of leadership, funding, economic development, and collaboration that are central to the success of all smart and gigabit city initiatives in cities like San Francisco, Kansas City, St. Louis, Toronto, Amsterdam, Moscow, Barcelona, and Singapore. Thank you for joining us today, David. I'll turn it over to you now. There we go. So I do have control now. Thank you very much, Julie, for the introduction, and thank you to the IEDC for letting me present today. My name is David Sandel. I'm the CEO of iNeighborhoods. We build smart cities for the digital age, one neighborhood at a time. The presentation I'm going to show you today is about the iNeighborhoods ecosystem and economic development planning model, which is a, essentially an outgrowth of Kansas City Google Fiber um, after I worked with the um, leadership of Kansas City and developing the playbook for that market. 
I put together a team of consultants from Kansas City and St. Louis. We started doing projects in the USA and Canada. And as we've worked on this big picture vision of these uh, gigabit cities and smart cities, we learned that um, small form factors were actually a much more effective way to proceed, provided that you had the right community engagement process and ecosystem development planning process in place. So let me see if I know how to use this here. Okay, and here we go. And as Norm was saying before, Norm, you did a great job. We have come a long, long way. If you look back uh, 50 years ago, we had the good old telephone company, the incumbent. And if you all remember, the telephone company had a central office, they had wiring centers, and they provided us with telephones at a low cost. Um, we had actually no choice in the type of communication services we had, except for what was provided by the incumbent telephone company. And we've seen that uh, accelerate and change dramatically over the last 30 years. So after the telephone company, the internet was released to the general public and the private sector for development in 93. And then we had um, what was called by many the build it and they will come as an enormous amount of cash went into the marketplace for developing networks. At that time, I was working for Cisco Systems out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was uh, originally in the service provider division. Later, I was in the CLEC division, which stands for Competitive Local Exchange Carrier. In around 2000, when the bubble burst, 98% um, of the companies that were part of Cisco CLEC division went bankrupt. The build it and they will come model was truly found to not be to work uh, properly. It was very necessary to have a well thought out business plan, economic development plan, and ecosystem plan which I'll talk a little bit about later. Then in the recent future, we've seen the revolution of the iPhone, where we see a continuing lowering in price and cost of compute power and communications and memory. This has brought about a revolution in data and mobility. All of us pretty much have a device today, and we still are going to see a lot more of that come here in the near future with small cell and 5G. Then uh, Gigabit Cities came along. Gigabit Cities was initiated by Google in Kansas City. Google was very interested to see innovation and entrepreneurship around gigabit capacity and how it would affect the local development of the community and new types of jobs and applications. And then as the price performance continued to improve, we see smart cities and IoT come along, where now we have all types of sensors which can be used to for virtually any type of application to sense environments, processes, civic activity, and so forth. But what this all really boils down to is, over the last 30 years, we're heading into a digital industrial revolution. Like Norm said, we're at the tip of this, and everything is going to change as a result of this. You know, the last 300 years, we were in an agricultural revolution, which led to an industrial revolution. So we're now heading into a digital industrial revolution. So I think one of the key things that we should discuss today is how do IEDC members as economic development specialists prepare for the future, manage change, and capture opportunities in this digital world? And one of the best ways I've found to describe this is actually to take a step back and look at the past infrastructure and how the past infrastructure affected economic development and socioeconomic development and progress. If you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, it says speed gave birth to prosperity. Mobility changed everything. What's been learned and researched over the years is that every time the human race has been able to do something at a faster speed, it produced economic development impact and more social impacts. This can go all the way back to from walking to having a canoe to basic transportation. So in the slide here, um, you see this, um, this is actually the city of University City, which is just outside of St. Louis in St. Louis, Missouri. And these early pieces of infrastructure, which I'm gonna go over, the trolley and the car and the other things you see around them, 
such as the telephone poles and electrical distribution changed everything. So let me show you how that happened and how it relates to the future. So that's what we'll call legacy mobility, the, the mobility of the previous industrial revolution. <clears throat> and now as I change the slide here, this trolley back at the turn of the century was considered high tech. Um, in the 1800s, you could not go from the city of St. Louis far outside of town unless you had a horse or a horse and a buggy. When the trolley came along at 10 or 15 miles an hour, it was high tech. And this city of University City, which was only 10 miles from St. Louis, could not have come into existence without that trolley to move people. So once people could move at a faster speed, greater economic impact happened, which you see in that picture, everything around it. The same is true for the automobile on the side of the street. This at that time was also high tech. It was a luxury item, could be afforded by few, but it had the same economic development impact. As people move faster, economic impact followed. So let's look up here at this billboard up on top of this building. This is um, social media at the turn of the century where an advertisement would be posted with paper and glue and put up on a uh, frame for everyone to see. And then this next frame here shows old telephone poles, which was a strictly wired system using point-to-point -point wires between the central office and your telephone at home, which enabled people to speed things up once again by being able to talk to each other whenever they wanted. And this next pole here was for early electrical distribution. That power enabled all types of economic developments to take place that you actually see in this picture, including the trolley, the car, the telephone, and so on and so forth. And then another one is this gaslight on the street here. That gaslight provided basic visibility to the neighborhood, and all of these things together created economic development impact on an enormous scale. So the key about this is that if these technologies hadn't existed about 100 years ago, you wouldn't have seen the growth in our cities today. But the most important thing in the bottom left-hand corner is this young lady over here. She was on the sidewalk 100 years ago. Her mobility environment was around her, as we have just described. And now if we zoom fast forward to today, and to what's about to happen here in the very, very near future, we can see the next round of infrastructure development that's going to take place. So this is what I call Smart City 2.0. If the original Smart City was the old legacy infrastructure, Smart City 2.0 is definitely about the new infrastructure. As you can see now, the young lady on the left-hand corner, she now has associated with her a whole different types of computing devices and sensors. She might be wearing a set of glasses or sunglasses which have sensor or, sen or 3D visioning devices built into them. She might have a watch which has communication capabilities or the ability to monitor her status for health or any types of medications she's taking. Um, any type of jewelry might have sensory mechanisms or self-protection mechanisms. And on the bottom here is a very interesting one is a shoe. Um, there are shoes that are being developed now that have sensors in them that detect the wear of the shoe and how fast it's wearing out and how your body is actually positioned within the shoe. So shoes can be made for you that fit you um, personally. So if this is just one person and they're jogging and they have this many devices associated with them, she could then be in contact on the right side of my screen here with these different aspects of the economy, whether it's an industrial application, agriculture, medical, education, um, autonomous vehicles, finance or environment, all of these different aspects of the economy are gonna grow and respond and in the center of this picture, what you see is essentially the infrastructure world 
that's here now and is about to grow very, very rapidly with small cell and 5G. Just like in Smart City 1.0, where those early legacy infrastructures impacted economic development and social development, this new high-speed environment will um, create an entire new round of economic development and socioeconomic impact. So the question again is, how do economic specialists prepare for the future, manage change, and capture opportunities in a digital world? Remember before we talked about how um, 50 years ago we had the telephone company where there was essentially no choice. Today in the world we have an enormous amount of choice and as these new infrastructure opportunities arrive, there are going to be many, many different choices in terms of forming relationships, whether they're P3s, public-private partnerships, um, special types of for-profit arrangements, many things to do. And economic specialists need to be aware of these as they arrive so they can capture these opportunities and their benefits for their communities. So I'm going to go through an example of how this um, works. And, um, and in this example, I will provide enough information to the economic development person to know what to look for as the next uh, wave of digital infrastructure arrives. So up here on the top, Google Fiber, as I mentioned earlier, was a very large scale project. There were essentially um, three prime contractors, 76 subcontractors, 1,000 vehicles on the ground, um, a very large amount of capital was spent. Um, this was a vision of the future of what a smart city could be like. It was a vision to stimulate the development of entrepreneurial activity and new types of applications to see what the new world could look like. Um, a lot of cities wanted this and still do want this. However, it was very large. It's very expensive. It takes a long time to build out. And it's difficult to adapt. Why is this important? We are now in a world where the pace of change is so fast and is going to accelerate that we have to be more agile and we have to become more minimal, viable product oriented. So one of my recommendations to economic developers are is to think small in terms of these initial relationships that you develop with providers or digital um, technology companies and think in terms of um, pilots that will work easily, have a, a synergistic core of stakeholders and they're low in cost. And if the business model is really there, they should grow organically on their own and create more attraction and investment. So what we did with the iNeighborhoods ecosystem model is essentially that we reversed the model of the large Google Fiber project and we created a small and cost-effective way to go about this by merging economic development planning with ecosystem planning with infrastructure planning. So what's important with this model is, is that the location for an iNeighborhood has to be very thoughtfully considered. It has to be in a place where there are a lot of community amenities, creative organizations, and access to capital in one place, but the environment has to be completely inclusive and allow everyone to participate. Um, an iNeighborhood is also a place where you can have an optimal stake stakeholder mix. Um, this could include the city, it can include the university, it could include an economic development organization, they could include different types of innovative or creative organizations, or any mix or combination of the above. But when these stakeholders and these goals are aligned in a part of the community that has hyperconnectivity and it's in a very good location, we see high economic impact taking place in that specific location that is highly adaptable. And why is this important? Because this new world that's coming, you're going to see changes come about every 18 months to two years of new stuff coming along. So cities are going to have to adapt to this. They're going to have to adapt to this and learn how to manage change. And they'll need a part of town which is dedicated towards economic development around future digital capacity. 
We also have identified a new term called force multiplication, and this is very important. What we've learned is that when economic and ecosystem planning activity converges with infrastructure ecosystem planning and activity, we see greater community revenue flows, ability to develop revenues from day one, and greater impact to the local economy. Let's go to the next slide here. I cannot see the slide in black. Delaney, is there some way you can advance the slide? I can't see the button in the black slide. There we go. So here's the I neighborhood recipe. And this is for cities for a digital world. The target ecosystem, something small. Whoops, go back. I apologize, the uh, system here is slow to respond. Can we go back one slide, please? Well, I guess it's not going. Um, what I'll do is um, the recipe for an I neighborhood is pick a location that is small, that is in a synergistic part of town. Um, be very aware of what part of town it is in. It needs to have a combination of community amenities, living options, transportation options, coolness factor, which is very important to attract uh, young people and startups. And what we do is we put in place a integrated community planning process. And what we do in that process is we look at the stakeholder group that's involved. We look at the entrepreneurial ecosystem, its stage of development, um, its gaps, and we make recommendations on how to empower that entrepreneurial ecosystem. We look at the educational ecosystem in the same part of town. That would be K-12 in higher education, um, look at their stage of development. There we go, this slide just went back the other way. And um, we also build into this a uh, community engagement process, um, workshops and a playbook process, so that the community as a whole works together to develop a plan that's in their mutual benefit and will generate these impacts. We then assign community champions to each one of the plays in the playbooks just like was done in Kansas City Google Fiber. And that's what really drives us. It's a community activity. It's an ecosystem that's been activated. And we also do business planning and infrastructure planning such that revenue will be generated from day one from a small thoughtful deployment than the very long capital expenditure cycle and return on investment for large infrastructure environments. By doing this in the right place of town, as this grows organically, the community will be able to see the smart city business case organically in action, can see what works, what doesn't work, can develop policies and incentives for other things to grow. And of course, this then attracts public and private sector opportunity to this part of town. With all those things in play, the I neighborhood then grows and can lead to the development of larger infrastructure investments sooner. So there we go. So here's force multiplier in action. So what it does is it takes on the top here, community integrated solutions, which include inclusive community engagement, um, assessment of the ecosystems around entrepreneurship, education, equity, and so forth. We package that into a building the smart city workshop, develop a playbook and champions, and that's all across the top. These things create community engagement, which develops community impacts, which drive community revenues. Then on the left-hand side of the screen, using an engineering process that we call force multiplier for small cell Wi-Fi and IoT, we do go through an engineering process. We identify the properties and poles that can be used for the cell deployments under using compliant data. And you, by the use of master agreements, 
This allows other providers and service providers to invest in the neighborhood sooner because you're doing some of the legwork for them and this community development aspect will, will actually cause the network environment to use more. So the providers will have a more profitable environment and you'll have a more productive and sustainable community because there'll be more intentional focus and activity going along. Together, all these things result in improved long-term economic engagement. The next slide, so here's one example. Um, just before I go into this, two days ago, we announced another customer of ours. It's the New Jersey Innovation Institute in New Jersey. And we're going to start a planning process with them, um, possibly to have a number of I neighborhoods within the city of Newark, each with a different in a different part of town, with a different uh, branding process, ecosystem and uh, economic development process, and they would all be uh, networked together, and that would become part of the foundation of developing Newark as a digital economy. This one slide here shows the original Del Mar Loop Innovation Neighborhood, which is in St. Louis. And this is the original project which led to the development of iNeighborhoods, which was an outgrowth of Kansas City Google Fiber. And over here on the left, the Del Mar Loop Innovation Neighborhood um, Fiber Path follows a uh, the Loop Trolley route, which is almost complete today, so 2.1 miles. And in this part of time, there's a very eclectic selection of innovative, um, creative organizations. Uh, the university is very, very close. There's a high number of K-12 type schools, public or private, involved. So this environment will be very, very productive. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, we show something called the Smart City Internet Exchange. And this is a connecting point for different neighborhoods like this type which will evolve in the St. Louis area and can also be used as a platform to, the, to deliver other smart city services, analytics or IoT capabilities into the community. And just below the Del Mar Loop Innovation neighborhood here, we have the Forest Park area and we're talking to them about providing some of this advanced wireless capability with higher throughput um, IoT sensors so that when people are in the park, the park becomes a living lab for them to actually um, learn and uh, better understand what these applications are and then take them back into their neighborhoods and actually use them. Okay, so once again, I can't see the um, arrow down here. I will push the button. Okay, so here we go. Delmar Loop Innovation Neighborhood, Economic Development Impact. It is very important to understand in a digital infrastructure environment what the impact is going to be to the community. This tells investors, whether they're public or private sector, what's going to happen so that they can make thoughtful investments. It's also important for the government and local economic development agencies to see this so that they can understand what the community revenue flow will be like. This was one of the first economic development impact assessments that we did. It's a hybrid of different methodologies. It requires a very strong knowledge of that neighborhood. It requires an understanding of the community revitalization efforts that are in place, existing initiatives of different organizations. It requires um, knowledge of some existing economic development activity and numbers that are published under things like M-Plan and merging these all together. So what this impact statement told us was five to seven years out, once this initial investment had taken place, which is relatively very small compared to the results, then in that part of town, we would see a large number of jobs being created as these different organizations work together collaboratively to make this happen. So this is a new form of digital economic development that neighborhood will have a P3 uh, not-for-profit governing body, which will collaborate with all the entities within the neighborhood, and they will together produce this ec economic development impact. So go to the uh, next slide now. So takeaways and lessons learned. Smart cities are 90% sociology and 10% infrastructure. We've been taught for years that Technology is the name of the game, but
but in this future environment coming up, it's all about collaboration, it's about stakeholders, it's about community engagement and involvement, getting them involved in their ecosystems, understanding the ecosystems, identifying community champions to make things happen. That human aspect is what will drive the nuclear engine behind your digital infrastructure. So careful planning in that area is very important. So you have to plan for your ecosystem as the path to the success. Lead with inclusion and community engagement, and that will attract the investment that's necessary to make things happen. The other lesson learned is, I could say less is more and tiny is huge. As we saw with the Kansas City Google Fiber um, initiative, it's had some very large impacts over there. But what we've learned is if we do this on smaller scales, more thoughtfully, with a tighter stakeholder group, with tighter economic and ecosystem planning, and community champions involved, we can expect a much higher output from a thoughtfully small footprint that has been carefully selected than if we do something on a very large scale from the beginning, which will take a long time to pay back. So Norm mentioned the International um, Community Forum, excuse me, the Intelligent Community Forum is a great group to work with. There's also another one in the Gigabit City Summit in Kansas City. They are unique in that they are also focused on how do we actually achieve these socioeconomic out, uh, outputs and impacts? How do we make things happen given the context of a new infrastructure environment? There's different types of uh, program activity at the summit around education, community engagement, inclusion, economic development, and on and on. Strongly recommend participating in, in that. There's about 500 people that have been attending that uh, yearly now, and it's a great best practices venue for smart or gigabit cities. So Julie, that's my presentation, and I'm ready for questions. I think Norm is too, and I will turn it back to you. David, thank you so very much. And we did get some questions coming in, and I think this question could be for either or both of you. And the would love to hear more thoughts on ways to revitalize historic Main Street downtowns with te technology infrastructure. For example, smart poles with speakers, safety lights, et cetera. That's a, a very, very good question. And I think Norm and I will both have question, uh, responses around that. You know, when we developed iNeighborhoods, we looked back into the past and, you know, our country used to be filled with um, very thriving Main Street areas. And that was because of this early slide I showed with those early technologies. So if we now revitalize some of these Main Street areas using these technologies, but use this new type of inclusive economic development planning, stakeholders, ecosystem planning, workshops and playbooks, and bring the community together and then have an infrastructure plan, I think we can really see the revitalization of many of these um, historic uh, American main streets. And um, with that thought, I'll turn that back to Norm. Yeah, I think there are really uh, two aspects to it. One I sort of very briefly referred to, which is um, you really want to help the uh, Main Street stores and, and uh, other uh, establishments on Main Street uh, participate in the sort of global internet economy, if you will. Uh, you know, I talked about using virtual mirrors. There are lots of different ways in which they can actually compete against the uh, Amazons of the world. The second thing that's obviously important is you need to get customers to come there in the first place. They need to go back down to Main Street. And that's one of the reasons why I've emphasized that the need to to integrate the, the new digital kind of layer, if you will, on top of the physical infrastructure you have on Main Street so that people will actually have a reason to go down. There's something new and cool going on uh, and vary it all the time. It, you know, the nice thing about uh, technology, uh, you know, and software in particular is it's flexible. It's soft, right? So it's not a big investment that needs to go on all the time. You can change it every single day and you can change it for seasons. You can use this if you have festivals on Main Street. You can um, sort of provide teasers for it for weeks ahead as people are there to remind them to come back down um, or you can remind them what they missed in case they didn't miss it. Um, and you can do that in all parts of town. Uh, um, so there's a lo lots of different things you can do that are relatively inexpensive um, to both bring customers, to attract them to even visit Main Street again and then to help the stores that are there take advantage of the, the people who are walking by. 
You know, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, both of you. And I loved your examples, uh, Norm, on how you used vacant buildings to project interactive things going on. And there's a YouTube video, and I think this was over in the UK, where they had um, stationary bikes and they had a video on the side of a building. And the harder you pedaled, the more the um, screen uh, action change. So there's ways to get people down to your downtown by making it more interactive. And I think you had some wonderful examples in your presentation. And so I just want to say that these presentations will be available to all of our attendees today. Well, so, Julie, if I, if I can just jump in, I mean, you actually reminded me about something else. One of the things you can do is a lot of times people don't know what's going on in downtown. I mean, they may not be able to see these things. You can have some real fun. You can show, you can project on the outside what's happening on the inside of a building. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even show them in a, in a new restaurant what the kitchen looks like if they want to. And maybe you don't want to show that. But the point is, <laughs> but the point is though that you know you can do all sorts of new stuff to really make it more exciting for people to be there and to understand better what the, the whole life of Main Street is about. Exactly. Yeah, I think we should include one other thought. Is um, you know, when we talked about the old Main Street with the trolley, the trolley brought the coolness factor into the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. this type of infrastructure and community planning and engagement is the new coolness factor and it attracts startups it attracts millennials this is the way they want to relate to the world now in the new main street so all these things have a very high potential provided they're done in a thoughtful way okay i have a question for dr jackness and then a follow-up question for david so dr jackness you mentioned that you teach ai what do you think is its impact on economic development in the future in a world where all information with all the information one could possibly need and use be available freely and what is the role that ed can play in that future oh wow that's a whole separate seminar <laughs> <laughs> it really is isn't it? Uh, 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 I, uh, well, first of all, there are some assumptions in that. I'm not sure all the information is going to be freely available. That's one of the issues that we actually have as a matter of public policy going on right now. Uh, just put that word of caution out there. Um, I, I think that um, um, you can uh, – one of the things uh, that are immediate that I, I think affect economic development is that the machine learning artificial intelligence uh, technologies make it a lot easier to customize the experience for individuals um, in any situation. Um, so that it's not just that I'm coming, um, you know, sort of to the downtown of uh, of my city, um, but it becomes me and my city. Something unique about that experience that you can you can create using artificial intelligence based on the information you have about the person, um, and and this makes it makes their uh, existence in the city much more much deeper, and and will keep them there. Um, and obviously, all the economic trends we've been talking about are just going to get uh, stronger. Um, over the years as artificial intelligence developed. The, the, the traditional uh, dependence on a local factory providing lots of industrial jobs is going to even disappear more than it already has. Um, and people will be able to do all sorts of things, um, remote, you know, if you will, remotely from wherever it is you think that stuff is happening. Uh, that's a yes. real quick answer. As, as I said, I mean, I wasn't joking. It really is a whole other seminar. <laughs> Yes. So if you have additional questions on that, please type them in and we'll have um, Dr. Jackness respond to you directly. So, David, the question that uh, is posed for you when you're talking about the neighborhood that has a P3, was an economic district or a taxing district established to help guide that process? Oh, thank you, Julie. That is a very, very excellent question. And um, the answer is going to be that every community is going to have a different plan. Um, and the reason for this is, and whoever answered this question was seen through the layers of this, I mean, it's very easy to put a not-for-profit in place. But then these other types of community development districts exist, whether it's a community, in, in, uh, community development district, a neighborhood investment district, tax district, special business district, on and on. But the um, many economic development organizations aren't aware yet that they could actually put these types of districts in place to support a digital infrastructure plan and ecosystem planning as a new form of business district. I mean, in the past, these business districts were put in place to support traditional legacy economic development built around the road and the cars and the real estate 
now you can have a whole another economic development district based upon economic development and digital infrastructure and community engagement. So the answer is there's a wide variety of ways of doing this. You can use different um, of those economic development districts, or there can also be ways that are purely for-profit and done with a number of different for-profit partners. So that's why you have to go through this community development process to understand what's the best fit for that neighborhood. Very good, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, one more question here. Um, how do you anticipate, and this is to both of you, how much will green policies influence the future infrastructure? So, can you say that again? You mean green policies? Yes, policies that are being adopted statewide but might eventually be uh, nationwide at a federal level where requiring green technologies, green fuels, all those things. How, how do you foresee digital maybe being a solution to some of this or that there is going to be some obstacles with green policies? Do you, do you, have you looked at that, I guess I should say? Um, uh, David, you want to go first? I have, but I wanted to let David talk about it from a local point of view first. Sure. Um, this is an interesting question, too, on a neighborhood basis. Um, as you know, there are different neighborhoods and main streets that have adopted green policies as a way to attract business. So, And we're also seeing um, utilities starting to develop different types of uh, alternate energy um, systems that can be used in neighborhoods. So neighborhoods that have greater digital capacity have the ability to have more monitoring and sensor mechanisms in them, which will support stronger green policy impacts. So I would, that's another area of where this policy, digital infrastructure, um, energy conversation and conservation and economic development all come together. I would say yes, so you know, a good digital infrastructure will support green policies because many of these green policies will be activated or sensed by um, digital devices. So I have two parts to my answer. One actually goes back to the question about artificial intelligence. I think that um, uh, now with the digital infrastructure and uh, traditional production of power um, and, and pollutants and all that, you really actually uh, are able to dramatically reduce uh, the amount of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, I'll give you one example. Everybody thinks of Google as being this great leader in uh, analytics and machine learning, and then they are. But they even found when, when they went past, they're sort of just using their experts to reduce the cost of running their data centers uh, and actually started using machine learning. They were still able to reduce uh, their electric power utilization by a third. So if you think about it from an account development point of view, that means a third less money you need to spend on, on one of the foundational capabilities, electricity, uh, for economic development. It makes some things more feasible that weren't feasible uh, yesterday. Uh, and we're going to see a lot more of that. I think the other is that these technologies, the second thing I'd say is these technologies we're talking about, um, although we talk a lot about the cloud, um, a lot of them don't necessarily uh, you know, need to require heavy um, investments of infrastructure that we've talked about. If you, if you could put together solar and the, the um, technologies related to solar and the internet together, uh, you will find that you actually are able to do things that are a lot greener. I'll give you I'll give you one way of thinking about it. Uh, you know, it was 40 years ago that the idea was that you know we would get our telephone service through a line and our television through the air. And today it's reversed, right? We get our television broadcast through uh, a cable connection, and we most of us use uh, wireless connections for our phones. I think you're going to see some of that same shift as you get more connectivity. Uh, using the internet. There are a lot of other things we've traditionally depended on with very expensive infrastructure that have caused greenhouse gases to go up. A lot of that stuff will, will be able to be decreased. Excellent. Question from the audience. We are a rural community. Our concern with providing fiber to the home is that people, especially kids, won't play outside as much and our interpersonal community fabric will weaken. We are leaning towards offering public Wi-Fi access points instead of fiber to the home. To encourage people to continue to interact and socialize. Are our concerns with fiber to the home unfounded in your experience? Any practices to share on this topic? Well, that's a very interesting question, and Norman, I think we'll have um, some good response on this. One of the things that we, we've learned is that um, 
you know, public Wi-Fi is going to be part of the future without question. However, um, many of the public Wi-Fi business models and infrastructure solutions have not been that effective up until recently. And this has rapidly changed over the last year. And this small cell revolution that's taking place, if your, if your community can work with small cell providers, you can actually work with them to have them forward fund on their own the development of the um, small cell 5G infrastructure in your small town and then you bolt onto that infrastructure as part of your agreement, public Wi-Fi zones for the general use of the community. Whereas in the past, a community might put up or spend a lot of money for public Wi-Fi only, and their business case is much more difficult. Now we can work with the service providers and negotiate an agreement whereby they'll, they'll go ahead and put small cell 5G infrastructure in place, and as part of the agreement, the public Wi-Fi goes with that. So it's kind of a reversal of fortunes that um, cities can harvest now. I would add, you know, by the way, some of the, the cell providers, I'm sorry, some of the uh, internet providers and even some sort of community groups have realized they can take a, a bit of the fiber connections that everybody has through cable modems and things like that um, and offer them for Wi-Fi to the street so that you don't necessarily need to build it out. You can actually have uh, along the street, um, people getting access to Wi-Fi that's, uh, uh, if you will, a shared uh, piece of everybody else's internet connection. Uh, but to the point, I've actually done a lot of work um, with small communities. In fact, one of the efforts that I lead at, at ICF is with small towns and rural areas. So I've given a lot of thought to this. Um, and I would say that, uh, uh, although there haven't been a lot of studies about this so far, because we're in the early stages, um, there's an interaction between the virtual and the physical effects. So um, as, as a community actually has more virtual communications, they also tend to find reasons to come out and meet together and have those physical connections. Uh, and it actually tends to reduce the sense of isolation that some people have in, in well, much more rural communities, not even necessarily small towns. Um, so I, I don't think it's, a, it's a one versus the other. Uh, I think these things uh, play together in helping to build a sense of community. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, during the winter, uh, for certain parts of the country, and I don't know where you're from, where this question came from, but certain parts of the country, it's hard for people to get out in the winter. Um, and, and so one of the, for example, of the story, one of the most successful projects that I'm aware of in rural health care was in rural Vermont, which gets pretty rough winters. Um, and they actually used the Internet to bring together uh, senior citizens in a virtual Tai Chi class when they couldn't maneuver out because of the nature of the weather. Then, of course, during the summer, they all met with each other at local parks. Um, so these things help uh, ensure the continuity of community connections, not necessarily uh, run in opposite directions. Very good. I like that point. And will digital infrastructure make inclusion easier or more difficult? Or is it another form of divide between the haves and have-nots? Wow, <laughs> this is just a really big question. Another seminar. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, in the past, like if you look at the internet bubble where infrastructure was, you know, built out along the lines of build it and they will come without supporting business cases, and that sort of fell off in the two in you know around 2000. Um, the uh, small cell 5G revolution is going to have to go everywhere. Um, cities have a vested interest to make sure that this type of deployment happens everywhere. But what the carriers are going to look for is they're going to want to deploy cells first in areas that have the greatest amount of density or po profitability, um, different types of worker classes where they can sell more subscriptions. So this, again, becomes another negotiating point for cities of communities of any size is that there's an equity plan associated with the deployment of small cells in 5G. So that if they're putting small cells in uh, parts of town that are more profitable, then they should also have to be required to put small cells and public Wi-Fi infrastructure in disadvantaged parts of town and redistribute some of the shared profit from that to the other side of town where normally these things might not be profitable. So spreading out that income across the entire equitable infrastructure is something that all cities should do and uh, could greatly help in solving this problem. And if we don't adapt policies like that, um, it could fall back to the same old game where you have the, dis the advantage and the disadvantage. And if smart cities are to you know, really be successful, 
um, inclusion is now the number right. one design parameter. I mean, exactly. everybody has to be involved, everybody has to be connected, or we're, we won't have the best ideas being brought forth to help develop our communities and the next version of the United States economy as it arrives. So I, I'm going to say, first of all, um, I appreciate the question. Uh, one of the six factors that ICF evaluates communities on is uh, how they're overcoming the digital divide. Uh, and how they're doing, uh, how good a job they're doing on inclusion. So I think this is very important. Um, I think that, um, and, and it's also important not just from a sort of, you know, uh, we're, we're going to be nice people, but I think from an economic development point of view, you've got tremendous potential uh, in those, uh, among those communities and those parts of the uh, population that haven't been served well. Um, and uh, you, thought you can now actually give them access to all sorts of educational opportunities that don't require them paying Harvard tuitions. Uh, you can give them access to all sorts of cultural activities, even working together. Um, and, and I pointed out the example from Nova Scotia of a fairly low-tech kind of thing, knitting bait bads. Uh, there are lots of people who have skills in these areas, and they just haven't uh, been able to uh, sort of find the economic potential in, in their um, in intrinsic skills that they already have, in addition to what they can learn from the Internet. So it's, so it's very important from an economic development point of view to make sure that all parts of the community have this. And it's not that hard to do. Um, obviously, you've got to negotiate, as David said, if you're depending on a local telecoms provider that has to make a profit. Uh, but that's one of the reasons, by the way, that, uh, by the way, that uh, some communities have gone the co-op route or municipal route to do their own projects. Um, and I would also point out the libraries have done an excellent job across the country of uh, providing free access to the Internet uh, with uh, computer devices. Um, and for that matter, even Wi-Fi. You'll see even after the buildings are closed, there are people who hang outside of the library building to get that access that they need to the internet uh, uh, for job opportunities for learning for whatever uh, that will help them improve their economic status. Excellent. So what the study showed is in growth areas are service industry is going to be a very large growing industry and I think we're going to see a lot of changes in that respect. But the second largest was healthcare. And the uh, I was just curious about the influence you two have seen with electronic medical records, which is now a requirement, and telemedicine and bandwidth that is required to do these things and the benefit of having a remote tool that has that kind of infrastructure. So have you seen healthcare influence some of the infrastructure in the areas of communities that you've worked in? Yes. Um... And it's a very, very interesting that what's taking place. Um, I belong to a consortium called Internet of Health Medical Things. This is a group that's dedicated to healthcare related to IoT um, specifically. And what's happened is, as um, Julie, as you mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, all industries are being disrupted. And one of the industries that is being disrupted is large hospitals. They're concerned that if um, smaller providers or smaller tech companies are more digitally en enabled, that they will be able to provide healthcare services to the home instead of the hospital. So in our consortium, we see many of the large hospitals are wanting to develop the application space for IoT, for healthcare, um, distance medicine, distance surgery, all of these things, so it'll go directly to the home so it won't be as so real estate dependent as it has been in the past. Yes. Um, you know, this is the same thing that's happening in the banking industry, where bank real estate is going to be um, required less. ATMs, drive-throughs will tend to disappear. We're seeing all these same effects in the healthcare industry, and um, having this type of infrastructure in communities that are thinking about this, and then developing plans and then bargaining with providers around this is very, very important because it'll help solve these problems. In the past, like we saw with the build it and they will come internet era of unfocused build outs, we're now in the era, era of very focused build outs with citizen engagement and ecosystem planning, and that'll make all these things really come together and happen. Yeah, I want to jump in on this as well. I think that um, uh, particularly for small communities, this is very important. One of the criticisms people have when they're living in small communities is they don't have access to uh, really good medical care that you'd get in big cities. Uh, with uh, the, and, and the regulatory environment, it's, you know, it's heavily regulated industry, so things move slowly. But the regulatory environment aside, 
uh, telemedicine has had dramatic impact, and some really interesting things have been going on. The uh, the Veterans Administration um, or the Veterans Healthcare System actually has created virtual intensive care units uh, that connect doctors elsewhere uh, with uh, patients who live in small towns. Um, this has had a big impact on psychiatric care. And in fact, there was one study in Texas in which they found that uh, psychiatric care um, was preferred by the patients in, in a telemedicine environment than in a personal environment, interestingly enough. Um, so, so these things are, are happening. Um, and uh, I, the other thing I'd add, going back to one of the points I made, is um, if you can uh, get a piece of the large amount of money we all spend on health care uh, to, to pay for part of your broadband projects, because it's going to be used for telemedicine, uh, that's yet another source of uh, money to get these things uh, to happen. Yes, a very good point. So this is for both of you. And I'm asking if you would give a recommendation to our audience on resource allocations for the next three, five, and 10 years. How would you advise our, our audience to allocate their limited resources towards the infrastructure build out over the next three ten years and how quickly they need to be at a certain place, which I think you guys know full well where they need to be? That's a very, very um, good question. It's very, very challenging. I mean, all communities are different. All communities have different resources. From my perspective, I would say that the Economic Development Agency needs to adopt these new forms of ecosystem planning, uh, community engagement, and development of a plan. And when they go through the planning process, develop these new economic development impact statements, ecosystem uh, development impact statements, and so forth, that will lead them to see the requirements of the community and the amount of budget that can be associated with that. Um, otherwise, without this type of com broader community impact from the different stakeholder groups and the ultimate users and the person in the street, it's hard to say, but this has to become a whole new paradigm within the economic development profession as we move from the you know, post-industrial economy into this new and digital world. Um, I would say a couple of things about this. First off, in terms of where you should spend your resources and time, um, uh, you know, we, we're all talking here today about broadband, but the reality is that people aren't necessarily using the connectivity they have now. So we should start getting people to take advantage of what there already exists before they you know, worry about needing gigabit. I think the second thing I would say is some resources are free. Uh, you'd be surprised. You know, David's talked about about neighborhoods, and and this and he's very right about it. Um, you know, you there's some resources around in your community that you're unaware of. That if you bring those people involved, uh, some of what you need intellectually, um, even uh, some other kinds of help, uh, can come as a volunteer effort as part of a community building. Um, the final point I'd make is uh, for me, and one of the reasons I'm interested in talking to you folks is that. Um, I really think that the, the first thing I'd like to see in most communities is is using this kind of infrastructure for economic development in the ways that I've talked about. Um, I know in a lot of places people talk about the schools, uh, they uh, talk about a variety of other kinds of things uh, in education. Um, I think the emphasis and the resources really ought to go into helping your community uh, connect to the global economy and to potential economic opportunities that they otherwise couldn't have been in the past. Uh, and really have a focus on building up the income potential of the people in your area. Very good. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to add to our webinar today for our guests? Yes, um, this is a huge, huge topic. Um, you know, we're just touching the surface here of infrastructure and how it relates to the future economy, and then you have all these economic development verticals associated with this. I mean, it is a huge topic, and um, I think education is going to be one of the big keys to the success of all this education and inclusion. We've got to, um, you know, provide education services to the community and to administrators and to leadership, and then we need to uh, include young people and even very young people because they're more digitally aware sooner than most of us and putting that all together inclusively and educating will drive this broader discussion of many different types of things that can happen. 
Um, I would say, uh, obviously, you need a vision as to where you're going to go for your community. You need to look out over the next 10, 20 years. Um, but I'd also say don't let that stop you from doing things now. It's really important. Uh, think about this as, as you're leading change for your community in some fundamental ways. Um, you need to sh uh, find some, some near-term victories, some examples. And people learn from examples, from, from su local success stories. Um, uh, look for those opportunities and be creative about it. And the people tell you, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know, forget it. Just find a way around those obstacles. I really think that it's important that uh, you start looking for ways in which you, together with your community, uh, can develop a, a, the local story about how you can do these things successfully. And, and it will grow from there. Excellent. Well, we do have future webinars coming up that are uh, a continuation of our Future Ready paper. So Thursday, October 25th will be the future of work. Thursday, November 1st will be the future of technology development and commercialization. And Thursday, November 8th will be the future of economic development practices, which I think we kind of touched on some of those today. So I want to thank all of our attendees, and I really want to say thank you to Norman and David for your time and your talent. It was a wonderful presentation for both of you, and I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you very much. And thank you all.